that's behind you. I hear, I hope it's not me. <laughs> I still hear a little beeping. No, I heard it's not No, it's over here. That's me.
will admit that I have been given great gifts, many talents passed on from earlier generations. But the greatest gift of all is a mind that never ceases to be actively searching, questioning, wondering, and dreaming. Even as I get older and find myself thinking I should have learned it all, I grow curiouser and curiouser, just as Alice in her adventures. And Alice does have a great adventure. <laughs> my mind and my imagination take me in some amazing directions and frequently keep me tossing and turning while waking me up at odd hours of the night. As a child, I saw myself as some sort of spokesperson for the downtrodden, whoever they were at the time. I was taught by my mother, a social activist in her own way, that people were often mistreated and we needed to be kind, generous, and open-minded to others. Well, she had once asked her mother many moons earlier, Mother, why has there never been world peace? Mother had her own opinion about wars. Can you repeat the last sentence that you said, please? That people were often mistreated and we needed to be kind, generous, and open-minded to others. It was there that she majored in the art of compassion and empathy. She did not march with suffragettes. She did not march at peace rallies and she did not sign petitions, but she was definitely outspoken when it came to being a guardian of people's individual and inalienable <laughs> rights to personal freedoms, especially if they did not hurt others. She was primarily a pacifist, but never attended rallies, and she was unafraid to speak her mind. She cared not a hoot who it was that hurt her. She was from a family of progressive, liberal, Russian Jewish social activists who fought against inequities and had their loyalty with socialists and communists. I am quite sure that her voice always echoed in the back of my mind. As a child, I had big dreams and knew that someday I would find ways to pursue them. What will I be when I grow up? The age old question that adults always ask children seems to not take into consideration that children are already being. And there are no easy answers. I don't remember if I ever had a vision about my future, but I was an original protester at the age of eight or earlier. The story continues. In the early 50s, when my parents separated, my father moved to the South where segregation was in full bloom. On one of several trips my mother and I took to visit my father and my brother in hopes of reconciling, I was enrolled in a public school while we waited for our house to be built. It was at this time that one of my first moments as a social activist took place. I was seven. When on a normal day at school in this southern town, I was confronted with the awareness that there were two sets of everything one for color and another for white. Two sets of water fountains, two sets of bathrooms, two sets of seats in the buses, two areas in restaurants. Everything seemed to be strategically marked in ways that said one set, one group apart from another, indicating a sense of superiority and inferiority. I had no understanding of that. I was a northerner. So I used the water fountain marked colored and the bathroom marked colored and I was summarily scolded by a fellow classmate while others stood back and nodded in agreement. I was labeled a pariah. How could I have done that? But something worse happened then. I actually stood up for the underdog. I said something like this, they're just the same as we are. My small classmates stood aghast at these words that hung icily in mid-air. In 1963, when my older brother joined his friends to go on the bus to participate in the March on Washington, I wanted to join him. My mother, the undercover champion of the disenfranchised, put her foot down and told me that I was too young, and I sensed there was some risk. 
Was I getting mixed messages? I was too young and a girl. My brother, four years older, had my mother's approval. I guess he didn't need her permission. I regretted that I didn't just go in spite of her concern, but I needed her consensus. I never set off to be a social or political activist. Between you and me, I saw myself as a bit apathetic. Apathy was a widely used term in the 60s and 70s. The most I had ever protested was a rise in tuition at the upstate college I attended. I was always involved in helping professions and went into teaching after receiving a master's degree. I worked at a small private school and often gave my students projects that challenged them to be more socially conscious. It was my way of teaching young people to develop their voice as a way of becoming thinkers and doers. I was not raised with any religious affiliation and described myself as a secular Jew. I suppose I was raised to be ethical, never praying to, God, to any god or gods. But I was always encouraged to be mindful of others, have respect for all living beings, sentient and otherwise. I was taught about love, compassion, and empathy. I was reminded that the saying, don't judge others until you have walked a mile in another man's shoes, was something to live by. Fast forward to 2013. You were concerned I was going to go year by year. <laughs> <laughs> I almost did. <laughs> Where I have reinvented myself over a 10 year span as a visual artist. I was often aware that my artwork never had any political or socially conscious message. I was in love with color and form, but not much for statements. A love for animals of all kinds was something that I had always felt, but I have never been an animal rights activist, although some of my best friends were. Unlike my older brother, I have never belonged to any of the politically correct protest organizations in the 60s and 70s. I wasn't a member of SNCC, I never identified as a feminist, wasn't a women's liver, and never joined the anti-war movement but I was vehemently against racism and discrimination of every kind and would have fought for equal rights, but never did. It took a painting, that thing, 17 and a half feet long to propel me into any type of social action. <laughs> and it was a simple concept. It started with Gandhi and Ahimsa, the Sanskrit word for non-injury, that was the foundation for an opera written by Philip Glass, which I had recently seen at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. The name of the opera, Satya Braha, left an indelible mark on my consciousness. I thought it would be easy to transform myself into a Buddhist monk and choose a path of peace and austerity. My goal could easily be to give up all of life's material temptations and distractions and focus entirely on introspection and being the change I wish to see in the world. Would I really have to give up everything, even the blue shoes I had most recently seen in a shop window? But I digress. The painting I mentioned above is called The Adventures of Gingerella and I describe it as a dreamscape. It depicts a peaceable kingdom where a figure of a young girl comes floating down upon a land where all creatures, four-legged, two-legged, swimmers, crawlers, and flyers, live together in peace and harmony, the peaceable kingdom. They learn the language called I talk and communicate silently through sympathy. Creatures such as snake and Indian cow become friends, as well as giraffe and crocodile. Several Indian gods also live within this fantasy world. But why fantasy? And why is this dreamscape so far away from being realized? The painting was completed at an artist's residency two years ago and became a pivotal part of an installation that I created out in Riverhead in 2014. 
I was one of 14 artists who had applied to the East End Arts Council for the opportunity to create work that would be part of the revitalization of downtown Riverhead. When writing up the overview for my proposal, it had come to mind that the raison d'etre for the painting was more than just the color and the form and the pleasing aesthetics of the work. I had created a world where I wanted to live and I wanted others to join me. In order to create that world, I had to become the change. <laughs> I needed to become a peace warrior. My role models were Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, and it goes on and on. I had a short time to transform, but I knew that I was dealing with possibility and potential. I was not going to stop trying before I had started. The young girl in the painting was my alter ego, Isabel. It was through her that I knew I could spread my word to others. I wrote a story and developed a stronger voice. I spoke to people of peace and compassion and promoted that as a way we could all change the world. Some don't believe that is social activism. But I say that if we all see ourselves as peace warriors and continue to be that change, we are making a huge impact on the world. We don't need to feel guilty for not always being at the march or the rally or the sit-in or the dying because our impact on each one who enters our sphere becomes part of that transformation.
peace warrior that I have declared myself to be. My artwork has propelled me into a new phase of my life where I have decided not to run away from conflict, but rather to stay with it and work out some level of agreement. If that can be done, then there is a great possibility, a greater possibility for people to gain a footing into each other's differing belief systems. If we stick it out long enough and find some common ground in our shared humanity, is it possible to break down barriers that create the wars, violence, and degradation of a society? Is there hope? When the nine people were so viciously gunned down during Bible study in Charleston, South Carolina, by a young man who declared that he was out to save our country, there were many hot topics that got tons of airplay. Guns, racism, terrorism, there is a need to put a name on it, but it still remains nameless. I posed a very small political cartoon about guns on my Facebook page recently. My tendency is to assume that I have created a world on Facebook of like-minded friends. Some whom I have never even met became visible in the comments posted. But there was one response that was posted by one Facebook friend which belied that assumption. His response was the old tried and true argument given by many anti-gun control supporters. He insisted that it's not the guns that are the problem, it's the people. But guns are a big part of the problem. Three years ago, I would have hidden or deleted this virtual friend. By this, but this time, I stayed with the dialogue. And ultimately, we agreed that the root of the problem is that there is so much underlying hatred and anger stemming from so many inequities. Anti-bullying campaigns have become part of school curriculum, and children are taught very early. Recently, at my grandson's middle school graduation, I went into the big, beautiful school in New Rochelle and was taken aback by the walls which were covered with beautiful artwork reflecting this message, anti-bullying. Hundreds of feet of murals, painted tiles, and posters were echoing this message. Could we not see the benefit of teaching our children not to hate? Is it something built into the human condition? I'm neither a psychologist nor a sociologist, so I don't have the statistics or the research it might take to impress you. Remember, my premise here is based on a dreamscape. And without sounding trite, wasn't it Dr. Martin Luther King Jr whose speech resounded loudly over and over with the words, I have a dream. That was August 28, 1963. And it is now. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Sometimes fewer, softer, gentler ways can be the change. 